Welcome to the Wild Physio Podcast with your host, Andrew Weil. Today, I have Shrona Virtue back, and she's an Australian personal trainer, yoga teacher, online trainer, and she's the founder of The Virtue Method, which is practiced in over 60 countries across the globe and probably more now because it's been a couple of years since I've had her on. A huge welcome back to Shona Virtue. How are you? I'm great. Great to be here. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, it's nearly been two years. August 2020, I think it was. Wild. I Crazy. feel like oh, the last time I saw you, it was really hot and sunny though. So, I mean, it is Australian winter, so maybe that's why. But I distinctly remember it being quite warm, but it might have just been your very sunny house. Potentially. It might have been in the afternoon. No, it was in the morning. Anyway. Uh, anyway. Great, good times. First question is <laughs> dive in. straight into it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> How do you juggle uni, business, social media, social life, your exercise? Because for the listeners, you're doing full-time university at the moment. You're a psychology student. You've got a business. You obviously exercise. You've got your social media account. How do you fit it all in? Uh, the short answer is I don't fit it all in. And you have to you have to weigh up what's important to you at the particular time. I think the non-negotiables for me it will always be exercise just because I know that if this starts to break down, for those that are just listening, I'm pointing to my body, um, <laughs> then my brain also breaks down and therefore, you know, I'm going to be bad at all the things that I want to do. So exercise for me is one of those things that just will always be almost like software that's like running all the time, right? Like iOS on your Apple. I don't know what the Android one is called, but it's like, it's just always going to be running. Um, the goals around exercise change, obviously, because I can't be working really hard towards some kind of PB while I'm also trying to get high distinctions at university and launch several different products in my business. But exercise doesn't stop. <clears throat> um, it's just a question of kind of negotiating with yourself about what's realistic and how you can really fit it in. Um, social life, I would say, is the thing that is easiest for me to drop personally. Uh, that's just my personality, I would say. And it's not that I don't like people. It's just that I prefer to have like less interactions with people, but really quality interactions. So um, I'm happy to go like months diving into my work or diving into my studies and not really seeing that many people and then having really big and nourishing sit downs and conversations with people um, throughout the year. You know what I mean? So less of those, but like when they're there, they're like really connected. I'm not on my phone. I'm not kind of, you know, whatever social media and being like, here's me and my friends. It's like, I'm in, I'm locked in. And those really nourish me. And I, hopefully they're my friends feel good about them too. Um, and then I would say, yeah, in terms of juggling work and uni, that's probably the hardest, I would say, for sure. Um, because, you know, it's at uni full time, you're supposed to be studying 40 hours a week. That's what they recommend. So it's four units, 10 hours per unit. That includes your lectures and tutorials, apparently. Um, but, you know, the amount of reading that you have to do in psych for me is like insane. And uh, a full time job. I mean, especially when you're running your own business, that's like definitely, I would say a minimum of 40 hours. So it's how do you fit all that in and exercise? And so for me, it's um, it's all about scheduling and being strict with the times and breaking things down and saying when that time is up. So as an example, you know, I have like a specific time that I answer emails and then outside of that, I do not, I don't touch my emails. Um, same for social media. I have certain hours that I'm allowed to access it and it's purely for work, to be honest. I'm not, I don't sit there and scroll anymore. Um, and that's I, when I have that time, when that timer goes off, if I'm not finished or if I'm, you know, still, I still have three more DMs to answer or a post to finish, I'm just like, time's up. Like, we'll come back to it tomorrow or we'll come back to it at the next scheduled allotted time. And having that has really helped me because in my first year I just struggled I was just like all over the place how many minutes per day do you spend on social media do you think I don't know I could check I don't even know how to access those numbers but now I do 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening it's it's so funny you're mentioning this I don't know whether you remember back at the end of 2019 when you're on the hybrid therapist podcast I told you about how I have a app lock on my Instagram mm. And mm -hmm. I said that it was 20 minutes and you were shocked and you're like, how do you do that? How do you do 20 minutes? 
and it was very different obviously you have a huge platform so now you're using that as a method and I think that's because did you start psych 2020 or 2021 2021 was when I started psych right yes so I'm in second year now and um yeah so when we spoke what it was 2020 was it yeah the the first time was end of 2019 and that's when I brought up the fact that I use a timer with Instagram and you were like oh my god I can't believe you do that not at university yeah see I had to do that I didn't have to have to do it but I found that it was a definitely good tool to just limit my time wasting (laughs) Totally. And that, and that's the thing is that the whole app is designed to keep you there. It doesn't matter how strong you think your willpower is. These scientists, psychologists are fucking the ones that work <laughs> in these places are amazing at what they do. And they've created something that is insanely addictive and you can't fight it. So you, the only way you can fight it is to implement rules like that, where you are literally off it. You are like phone other room or out of, out of sight because it is the, the way we scroll, the way that the, the content comes at us, reels, right? TikTok, those sorts of, that structure of the way that, I mean, you if you look at it and you see what's happening, essentially as you're scrolling, this information is coming at you and it's just short enough to not quite satisfy you, but it's not, it, it's long enough that it can keep you engaged. And the algorithm will support really entertaining things. So this is why it tends to be like funny things, right? Or really alarmist things are the ones that get to the top um, in terms of the algorithm and what we'll engage with. And so if you think about what that's doing to you over long periods of time, the only way to escape it is to just physically be like, I have a rule and it's 20 minutes and that's it. It doesn't, it just really doesn't matter how strong you think you are when you're in it. You know, it is what it is. Have you got a TikTok? I do. And I'm terrible at it. I, I just don't, I, I feel like I might be a bit too old for it <laughs> and I don't know how to engage with it. So when I'm on it, I, I really feel that the psychologist in me hates, but loves the way that it's like, I, I can respect how they've created it. And I think it's absolutely amazing that they've created a, a product like this or yeah, a digital product like this, but something that was actually said to me in the DMs before when I'd made a point about um, the fact that I can't remember my initial point, but someone had written to me saying, when you, when the, when the product is free, you are the product. If that makes sense. Like when I think it was something along those lines. So it's like what we don't often realize is that we're like looking at this thing and we're like, this is my free app and I'm having fun. And it's like, yeah, you're paying with your attention. Yeah. (laughs) So (laughs) the attention you're giving to each person, whether it's an influencer or, you know, a brand or something you like to engage with, your actual attention, all those neurochems going back and forth in your brain are the product, are the, are the, are the thing that brands are paying to access, that influencers are paying to access. So that's the thing you have to realize about it. So yeah, the, I, with TikTok, it's absolutely such an amazing app and I love how funny it is and how entertaining it is. And I think that's great. I just haven't quite figured out how to engage with it in a way that I think is going to be beneficial. It's interesting with TikTok as well, with the screen management time on Instagram, you can make it a shorter period of time on TikTok. I think the minimum is 40 minutes, which is a fair bit of time. Yeah. I I, imagine. I, I checked out TikTok probably in the last couple of months. I was just interested about what people were talking about and I posted a few things and it's just interesting how the algorithm works, but the other thing is 40 minutes is the minimum you can put it on in terms of reducing your screen time. Well, I couldn't insane. believe that. You know, that's a lot. That's a, that's a long time. Now, when it's it comes to, time. when it comes to juggling, obviously the business, because it sounds like the business and doing university are the big things where you're trying to juggle those two. Yep. When it comes to those two aspects of your life, do you use a diary do you write down things? Do you use a handwritten diary? How do you how do you structure things? Yeah. So I I was using a handwritten diary, but then I'd find that I'd like leave it somewhere or something like it just wouldn't be as like strapped to me as as my phone, um, <laughs> whether that's a good or a bad thing. Um, so actually now I just put it all into a Google Calendar. But I will I will I'll show you on the 
sort of what it looks like. Like as an example, I've got everything. You can't really see it here, but basically oh, yeah. I'll write things as I actually write in the morning walk that I'm going to do the, um, you know, the practice that I do on it's a, this program called Quizlet which is flashcards online flashcards and so I'll do that in the first thing after my walk when my brain's like really primed for learning I'll use that time to kind of go through notes that I've prepared after that it's email time and so literally everything is in there including travel time and it's yeah it's a bit of a mission I guess to set it up but it's the only way that I can do it and I have alerts that tell me so it's like I know that in 10 minutes, the time that I have to finish emails is ending. So then that means that, okay, I'm going to have to get prepped for the next thing. And so it's just about being really strict with that. It's hard because sometimes you're right in the middle of like writing something, whether it's for uni or for work. And you're like, no, 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 I just want to keep going. And that temptation to keep going is what then bleeds into things. And then you start to feel overwhelmed because yeah, it's hard. It's hard to walk away from an unfinished product, but if you, dedicate if you look at it across the week and you are ensuring that if you let's say you have a project for example um and I have one which is like a new program and I could just sit and try and write the hours and hours to finish it but the chances are I'll probably get really distracted in that process but if I know that there's this finite time I it actually increases my productivity because I'm like oh fuck like I need to get this done and I need to finish these words and so like it just kind of keeps me really engaged in the product in the in the project you know what's a really good tool i often use is have my computer on like 20 percent, and then go to a cafe <laughs> or something like that and then i've got i've got 20 percent of time to do the work i need to do yes and then you're just That's forced to you've just forced to do it um when it comes to exercise are you putting that into your daily schedule in your calendar or are you just making it up or are you just throwing it in where you can fit it in no that is in my calendar it does sometimes fall away if like, like sleep has been impacted. So that's the one thing that, yeah, I think can sometimes disrupt that. And, and I, I let it disrupt it on purpose because if my sleep is impacted, particularly at uni, then my memory is impacted. A lot of cognitive function, obviously for everyone, right? Um, that happens when we don't get sleep. But right now, I just find that I really need to be accessing memory very quickly, you know, particularly around exam time. So yeah, the priority for me is making sure that sleep happens. So that means that when I wake up in the morning and if my heart rate variability is not very good, I have an aura ring. I was also using the whoop before. And so if I know that I haven't had a good sleep and I wake up and my readiness to train is not so great, then I will modify my, my training accordingly. Um, maybe I push it to another day, depending on what it was. Like if it was like a weights day and I knew that I wanted to lift heavier, then yeah, I would be like, okay, you know what? Today I might actually just do my zone two training instead of my weight training today and switch it up but i'll always do some kind of movement um, how many hours sleep per night is non-negotiable for shona uh you know what funnily enough since wearing this bad boy um i it has been showing me that i'm getting five and a half hours of sleep which is so bad and i feel it um which is why i knew that i needed to make some changes so I, like obviously i want to be between seven and nine yeah and back in 2019, I remember us chatting about Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker and you said yes. you had a bit of sleep anxiety. And it's yes. definitely a thing that I've had to deal with since reading that book as well. Like yeah. if, if you can't get to sleep at night, you would like, oh, freaking out. I'm like, I'm not going to get my seven hours, do you know? I, had, um, I played a game of golf probably about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and I had a Diet Coke at like four o'clock. Oh. And... I didn't what? even think about it because I normally play golf earlier in the day on a Wednesday yeah. and I played later and I had it at four and I got to 10 o'clock and I just couldn't sleep and I was getting anxious. I'm like, oh shit, I need to be up early tomorrow. And then I eventually did what he said, go out to another room, have a read of a book. And then all of a sudden I fell asleep, but still it made yes. sense because I'd had caffeine at you know four o'clock and the four half life was obviously six hours. So it's not going to end well. When it comes to exercise, what exercise are you doing per week? Like how many weight sessions, how many yoga sessions, how are you structuring it? Because a lot of people that are busy are going to find it hard to structure their weeks when it comes to exercise. Mm -hmm. How do you do it? Yeah, so I changed it not so long ago just to accommodate for just ramping up of uni and projects uh, at work. So now I do three days of weight training a week. 
they are full body sessions, but the focus is more on actually my hips and glutes, obviously, because I love those, but also because I spend so much more time now sitting down that I just want to really make sure that my hips are strong and staying strong, given that I'm probably more prone to being more sedentary. Whereas obviously when I have the luxury to train weights five days a week and then also do all the other things I want to do uh, movement wise, then yeah, I'll do a bit more of a split and I'll do isolated upper body days. Now I'm just doing a split that focuses on squat pattern, deadlift pattern and a hip thrust. And then I do upper body in between there. So I'm still working an upper body pull, lower body push or vice versa. And I found that to be effective at also getting my heart rate up, you know, like releasing endorphins in a way that cardio normally does, that weight training doesn't always do. But if it's this with shorter rest periods, then I feel yeah, I feel like there is an elevated heart rate, which feels good for me, even if it's not really, you know, it's not really doing any sort of zone two training. Um, and it's definitely not like high intensity training, but it's still elevating my heart rate, which is still going to benefit me. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And going forward, as you get into exam week, how do you go trying to structure in your exercise or is it just a non-negotiable during exam week to get through exam week? Um. I try to not, last year, I learned that those less, th these lessons that I now I'm trying to apply the hard way where um, it was like, oh, fuck, I'm just going to prioritize exam week because I hadn't done consistent work throughout. Now that I'm implementing things like, um, I, you know, Quizlet study. So like checking, doing my flash, flashcard study the whole way through, trying to get more of um, the terminology into long-term memory stores as opposed to it just being this kind of like cram short-term got to remember everything in which case yeah exercise probably has to fall to the wayside when that when that happens um, now that I feel like a bit more prepared a bit more knowledgeable hopefully that's going to mean that come exam week which actually is coming up fairly soon that exercise doesn't need to be take such a backseat yeah, for sure. And when you're trying to build a business, obviously everything's going well on the business front. Something's going to suffer, whether that being your relationships, family, friends, your exercise, your social life. You said that your social life often suffers a little bit, but that is a product of the fact that you are okay with that happening. Is there anything yeah. else that suffers when you are super busy with university and business? Um, it's interesting. I mean... I think everything has the potential to suffer, right? Mm. Like, I, I, you know, it's hard to say because it just, it just really, I think it all just depends on your values yeah. in life. And, and, and that's not a criticism of like, what do you value? It's just more like, you know, what, what truly, what do you value? And if you value, um, you know, growing your business right now, then I think that the relationships that you have around you, there's no shoulds in life, but I think like ideally you have people around you that support your values and support your happiness. Um, that said, human beings need strong relationships. Like we know that it's like a huge predictor of like physical health, not just psychological health. And those that value relationships tend to be healthier, tend to have, um, you know, just be essentially lower mortality rates, right? Because they're, they're, taking care of something that we can't quite quantify or qualify of what it is that makes relationships and healthy relationships so good for our physiological health, but they do. So I think you still have to make time for it. But again, that just comes back to my, my concept of like quality over quantity. So it's like, yeah, sure. You might not be going out every weekend um, and having beers with your mates, but how, much quality exchange are you really having in those times and I think sometimes that social media is leading us to like forget that to forget to ask that question because so much of it is like I'm going to show you all that I'm hanging out with my friends I'm going to like make sure that I story it I'm going to make sure that you know and so it's just that thing that I'm like well you know, sometimes like I watch people's stories and I see them all at the, the table and they're sort of sitting at the table beers around and they're just scrolling through their phone and then they're like oh here I am you know at this beach road blah 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 whatever it is and I'm like you know where's the quality in that so I'd yeah I'd much prefer to show my friendships less on social media and actually be connected when I'm with someone 
I completely agree. And there's nothing worse than going out for dinner or lunch or whatever so with someone and they consistently get out their phone. It really annoys me. And, you know, ha- when did it become okay for that to happen? And for you to just sit there around a table with a bunch of friends and someone be on their phone the whole time, it really annoys me. And you'd probably be able to delve into this with the psychology side of things. Even if you have a phone on the table with it up or down, yeah. it influences how engaged someone is, doesn't it? Yep, it does. And it also, the same thing goes for like cognitive function. They've done cognitive tests where they've got like phone in room versus phone outside of room, um, both just doing studies that are within subjects and, and um, between subjects, which basically means like testing the same cohort of people in two different conditions. And then in between subjects is when you have two different cohorts of people. And on, in, on every scale, when we have a phone in the room, it impacts our cognitive abilities. So our memory, our ability to make good decisions, fast decisions, to switch tasks, um, all of those things are impacted if the phone is literally in the room, even if you are not looking at it. So yeah, one of the best ways to actually improve your cognition and cognitive function is to like put that phone completely out of the room while you're doing your work elsewhere. Yeah, agreed. Or going for a walk in the morning without your phone, going out for dinner without your phone. You don't need your phone to go to dinner. It's It really frustrates me. I've had a, you know, over the years, I've had multiple occasions where I've just been like, mate, put your phone away. You know, yeah. Why do you need to be texting right now? It's just rude. It's rude. It's very strange. It's really strange. Imagine like back in the day, if someone just pulled a book out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Pulled the paper out. Just like flick the paper I out. And just, Sorry. I'm going to read yeah, this sorry. Now. I just saw this thing. There's like, it's just so, it's so strange to us. I mean, so much is like around the phone. I think something that's like really beneficial is, yeah, like saying you're going to go out and put the phone away. And then even when you have those moments, this is another thing actually for, for brain health, those moments where you, you go, oh, what's the answer to that? Right. And it's like, it is probably in your brain, like, oh, I know the answer. And then the first thing you do is you reach for your phone to like try and look it up. And it's like, why not just give it like two minutes and try and make your brain sit and work and don't worry about the other person in front of you waiting for the answer. You can both try and figure it out together and go, Oh, but we're so used to this instant exchange between two people now that we're losing patience to just sit in the moment and be like, um, it's there. I saw it. And we feel that pressure to like yeah. have an answer straight away. You know what yeah. I mean? So I think it's just practicing things like that that just make a huge difference, not needing to always have like a reference point be the phone. Yeah, 40 years ago, you would have had to go home to your encyclopedias and pull out the encyclopedias to figure out the answer. Um, answer. When it comes to friends, how many great friends do you think you really need as a human being? Oh, I don't know if I can put an answer on that. I mean, I, I, I like you know far out I don't, I don't know i'm sure there's a study because sure I, I think once you finish school you think that having more and more friends is cool and it's better and then as you get older i think you realize that quality over quantity is so important you know maybe if you have three to five really great friends rather than 10 friends that are just on the periphery that don't really give a shit i think is really important yeah it's it's hugely important i think again this perspective cultural norms are shifting where I mean, maybe they're not shifting but like they're certainly being reinforced in that we I see a lot of like there's there's this desire to really post big friendship groups hanging out going on a holiday and doing all that stuff and that's awesome like I think obviously it comes from a place of I love my friends and I this is you know this is great but I think what we then don't see is the intricacies of those relationships and how quality and how deep they really are. Are they actually nourishing bad behaviors as well? You know what I mean? It's like when people are going out getting absolutely messed up together. I can't remember whether I can swear on your podcast. I can. You oh. can. You already yeah. have. So whether, I know many times before, but I don't you know. You might have changed the rules. No, have no. I sworn today? I haven't sworn. No, I I've you, done no you said fuck once. <laughs> on this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well anyway point is is that you know you see a bunch of people getting fucked up together and how quality is that friendship really if you were to remove the drugs and so yeah that's just one thing like I think yeah I think as you get older you definitely realize quality over quantity but also I think you just don't have time yes. either as soon yeah. as like kids come into it you know your little family unit is like super important and even if you're not having kids your your unit of work or whatever you've decided to dedicate your life to often is is 
the underlying thing. So it's it's like actually what we then tend to crave is that quality, right? Because then it's like, no, if you only have a little bit of time for this friend, fuck having them on their phone the whole time. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, you know? for sure. So yeah. When it comes to online hate, everyone cops a bit of online hate at some point during their life, but no doubt someone with a big platform like you has had to deal with a lot of online hate through the years. How do you deal with it? And what recommendations or advice would you give to someone, especially someone that's starting out on social media with a business and they're starting to build a brand? Yeah, I think um, uh, I deal with it like any other human. Like my instant response is for sure. I get hot. I get, you know, I have a visceral response, I would say, to someone, you know, sliding into DM saying something. But it depends on what they're saying. And I think we have to make the distinct, the, the difference or distinguish the difference between hate and disagreement or hate and some kind of like objective criticism. And sometimes it's hard. Those lines are blurred because, and it depends on how sensitive we are on the topic. Like sometimes what is simply a criticism might actually feel like, you know, more than a criticism. It might, because it's a sensitive place for us. The other thing that can happen is that um, sometimes people are just, projecting as well and what I mean by that is sometimes it's a vulnerability or an insecurity of their selves I, I'm sure you know what projecting is but just for anyone that doesn't know um when, when it's an insecurity for themselves and they then project that insecurity onto you or they put it onto you um I think that can be another thing that can happen and finally there's just a whole lot of unhappy people in the world and they need an outlet for that and if you are the type of person like I am, I'm a big softy. I am really terrible with it. So like if someone comes at me with some kind of criticism, my initial response actually isn't to disagree with them. My initial response is to actually um, agree or to go, oh, am I bad? Like that's my initial response. And um, that's great for them because then they get to like put that onto me and I carry it for them. And then I start to process it. And it's taken me many years to go, I don't have to hold this shit for you right now. Like I can just either choose to block and delete or I can choose to just disengage or I can choose to try to diffuse, which I'd sometimes try to do, which is like, I see your perspective. I hear you, but you know, this is where we might miss a line or that's okay. You can hold that opinion totally, whatever. Um, so I think you have to choose the method that's right for you. But I think something that's not said enough is like, you don't actually have to engage with every bit of criticism you get. Yeah. That said, I think sometimes I like to at least sit with it for a second and go, okay, what is there? Is there space for me to expand my knowledge or my awareness? Um, I think sometimes the, the, the advice on this is like just block and delete, block and delete. And you can totally do that. But I think that's sometimes the part of the problem as well yeah, <laughs> these yeah. days is our ability to just go, fuck it. I don't care. I can shut it down. I don't have to. And then we're not really expanding our horizons or our opinions. So yeah. it depends on who it is. Like you also have to think about um, who you, I think it was um, Elizabeth Gilbert who wrote Eat, Love, Pray. Eat, Pray, Love. Eat, Pray, Love. Eat, Love, Pray. Eat, Pray, Love. Um, really, really, really big book in the noughties, I would say, came out. Do you remember it? They turned it into a movie with Julia Roberts. They turned it into a movie with Julia Roberts. Yeah, huge. Yeah. Like it was yeah. huge at the time. Yeah. Anyway, she, so author of, author of that book, um, amazing lady and has said some amazing things. She just says she gives three people in her life the right to critique her. Everyone else, she doesn't give a fuck. She's just like, I, she just doesn't engage. She doesn't read the comments. She doesn't, it because it's like, you don't know me, you don't know my life and I don't respect you yet, but only because I haven't had an exchange with you, right? So she has three people and those people are not people that are going to confirm her biases. These are three people in her life that she trusts to give her honesty and who she believes to be intelligent. She believes to have some kind of emotional intelligence as well. And so she takes it from them and she's very honest about that. And so I think that's a good measure for anyone that may be feeling like, they're getting a lot of it and they're not sure, or maybe they want to tackle controversial topics. You have to have people in your life. If you're going to go do that, that you can turn to and say, Hey, was I wrong here? Or is there yeah. something I'm missing and things like that? Yeah. You need to be, you need to be willing to be wrong. Yeah. That's for sure. You know, you can't always be right. You need to be okay to changing your opinion. I think, especially online. 
Totally. Like, what's the point otherwise? Like, what are we doing to just yell into echo chambers of things that are supportive of us? But you also have to be willing to stand your ground if you feel as though, you know, and that's something that I definitely have, you know, the other day I had someone comment, I did the heartbreak post, which you were like, do you want to talk about heartbreak? I'm like, a lot of people (laughs) thought I was like really in pain. I was like, no, I just had a lot of people asking me about heartbreak. I don't know, it must be the season for breakups. So I just sort of threw out some of my top tips, right, for dealing with breakup. And I've had my fair share. So I can definitely, I can definitely give some insight here. But I posted something and I said, therapy, and I said, this is a non-exhaustive list. There's a lot of things that can come out of this. There's a lot more like, let's comment below and and offer some suggestions that I've missed, right? And so one of the suggestions that I made was go to therapy and try cognitive behavioral therapy, which is like heavily evidence-backed. So there's a lot of strong evidence to support it. It's often alongside various different addiction practices as well so like cbt alongside you know like for for smokers or cbt for weight loss which has like so the literature there is really dense and really good and supportive of cbt um anyway point is is that i put that there as an option because i the thing i like about cbt practices yes it's often a bit cerebral but i find that the direction cbt moves in is like that it's very much about it's it's goal and system oriented. So it's about teaching you how to deal with these things when they come to you, but not just kind of like delving into your past and getting over associating with your history, your parents, any trauma that you had in the past, attachment theory, all of these things that sometimes we over identify with, which keeps us in this pattern, right? So I made this comment and I, it was just like, whatever, I said, this is one option. And then someone commented and said, you know, there are other options other than CBT. CBT, even though it's evidence-based, is a bit too cerebral for some people. And that was it. And I was like, fine. It doesn't. It didn't affect me badly. I wasn't like, no, oh, this person disagrees with me or whatever. <laughs> yeah, but it was yeah. more just that I was yeah. like, how is that a helpful comment? Yeah, like yeah. what would be helpful would be if you were to actually say, here are some other options. You know but what you I mean? Already, and you like, already said yeah. it was a non-exhaustive list. Totally. So it was just one of those things. So the reason I bring this example is that you have to, like some people are just wanting to disagree or some yeah. people are looking for reasons to, to project their discomfort with themselves onto you or to just scratch an itch, right? Like you maybe irritate them or maybe you irritated them in a post a while ago. And so they just, they're just looking for that opportunity. And, you know, really when they, when it comes at you, you have a choice to either like carry it for them and let it upset you and drink that poison. Or you can just go, that's cool. That's your, that's your stuff. It's all good. It's good advice for sure. You can't read too much. It's not easy. It. Yeah, it's not easy. I, I completely agree. And off air, you were talking about how a lot of people that are trolls are often projecting oh, yes. <laughs> psycho yeah, ten- so, so, psycho tendencies. Totally. So 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 this is quite funny. This Kate, this is a study that came out of uh, Poland. But what I will say is that yeah, there's a difference between someone coming on and just criticizing or disagreeing and then online bullying and yeah. online trolling and yeah. really like going in and like hating on people. Yeah. But they're out there. And in psychology, there's this, so we have like the big, what's known as like, so in personality psychology, you have uh, tr- known traits called the big five, which are openness to experience, um, extroversion, conscientiousness, what have I missed, agreeableness and neuroticism. And so we all kind of fall under the spectrum of these, right? Now, there's also what's known as the dark triad. And we're also said to have elements of these dark triad and the dark triad are narcissism machiavellianism and uh this one psychopathy (laughs) so i'll give you actually a proper definition of them um or at least a bit of insight so psychopaths tend to have a lack of empathy or remorse they have antisocial behavior they're manipulative and volatile um so there's there's a needs to be a distinction between um, psychopathic traits and being a psychopath. So it's that's different. And the distinction normally held there is like criminal violence that can that can occur. Machiavellianism um, comes from the 16th century Italian politician who wrote a book called The Prince. Have you ever read that? 
No. I actually think you would love that because you've got some Machiavellian traits in the best way possible. I think, <laughs> by the way, having some of these traits is also associated with success and, yeah. and like there's nothing wrong with them. And this was sort of the premise of, of the book, uh, The Prince, um, which is actually an endorsement of the dark arts, utilising, like if we notice, you know, across politicians, there's always this tiny little bit of like, evil in them which helps them to get further so he wrote this book in an effort to teach people like how essentially you can take those dark traits and maybe use them for good so those traits are associated with duplicity manipulation self-interest and a lack of both emotion and morality i just brutal. called you mac Mellian. brutal you effectively <laughs> brutal, called but... me evil no i no, <laughs> there's joking. no word evil I'm in joking. there you um, and then you narcissism yeah, and then narcissism, which a lot of us know what that is like, you know, so uh, selfish, boastful, arrogant, lacking in empathy, um, and hypersensitive to criticism. So, again, we probably, if we're really honest, know that we all sit somewhere in these, maybe not psychopathy, maybe not. Um, but, you know, you could say, I, have, I don't really have antisocial behavior, but yes. Okay. So, what this study found, and it was only done with 94 participants. Um, but it basically, I'm just going to pull it up because it's quite an interesting study. And I've so they took, so 94 internet users, 41% of them being women, participated in the study. So 46 posted uh, hating comments. Um, and, and I think it was like 41 or something posted, uh, whatever you get to get to 94, <laughs> posted non hating maths was never my forte um non what was termed non hating comments so they took this these two cohorts of people put them together and after one month um, participants were invited to take part in a psychological survey and filled in the dark triad questionnaire the satisfaction with life questionnaire the scale of frustration questionnaire and the scale of envy questionnaire um, Basically, results showed that high scores in psychopathy subscale were significant predictors of posting hating comments online. Um, it's quite interesting. And actually, high scores on the uh, envy scale were marginally significant as well, marginally. So they weren't as significant as psychopathy traits, but envy, if you were high in envy, then there might be some significance to to your prediction of, of posting online. Were they, were they blinded from what they were trying to test for? Oh, yeah, they weren't told. It was just yeah, like, yeah, let's look yeah. at what... Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's basically... Yeah, this was one of the first of the research at the time... Um, so. Sorokowski et al. Um, and it was posted in the Journal of Frontiers in Psychology, if anyone wants to look it up, um, called Are Online Haters Psychopaths? Psychological Predictors <laughs> of Online Hating Behavior. <laughs> it's a great title. Go to, go to Google Scholar, type that in, you'll find the first one that comes up. Exactly. I think it's probably definitely the only one with that title. But it's it's definitely really, I, I find it really interesting um, that that's there. And, and yeah, it sort of makes sense when you go back and think about the, the traits, the dark triad and what, what is there, antisocial behavior, absolutely being manipulative and volatile. I mean, all of these things are really easy to do online. And that's what you have to remember is that, um, these people doing these things to you and throwing this hate out there are only doing so because they're probably not going to get caught for the most yeah. part. And so it's really easy for them to do and do it without any repercussions. So it's just one of those things that I don't, as much as there are boards that are starting to try and stop this and there are definitely, you know, there are anti-bullying kind of practices and things like that, which, you know, again, a meta-analysis I found has showed that like anti-bullying, where is that study? Anti-bullying uh, practices or um, what were they? They were, let me pull it up because actually it's definitely interesting. I thought I had it up ready for you. Oh, now I can't find it. All right, well, anyway, point is, is that they can show to help, but we just need a lot more research on whether they're that effective. Yeah. How, last question before we finish up, because I think we've gone for about 40, 45 Go. minutes. Sorry, my bad. No, 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 don't. We could have gone for an hour. It, it doesn't really matter. Happens. We just let it roll. Um, how has studying psychology at university influenced you as a business owner, as a person, and just also a yoga teacher and also just a, um, a friend? So, um, oh, you just call me a friend, Andrew? Well, we're friends, but... I'm honoured. 
You, you and your closer friends. I'm not one of your top five. That's oh, sure. fuck. All right. Okay. All right. Take it back. All right. Fair enough. Um, so basically, look, I've always been interested in it. In fact, I wanted to do this degree for a very long time. I started it when I was 19 and then didn't finish it because, and I'm really glad I didn't because I didn't have the maturity, I don't think, at the time for this degree. It's so great to have so much life to apply to it. Um, I would say that it, look, it's really the reason I wanted to get into it and come back to it is because everything that I'm trying to do as a trainer and as a health professional is to influence people to take on better health behaviors, right? To improve their life. And I've always loved that part of my job. The problem is, is that it doesn't matter how great your programming is or how knowledgeable you are and all like really up to date with all the evidence from an exercise physiology perspective, I just find the hardest part, and I'm sure you can relate, is getting people to do the thing that you're telling them to do. And so I wanted to get to the core and to un- like have a really strong understanding of how can I utilize these psychological principles, health behavior, health motivation to get people to do the things that I'm telling them to do um, in a way that isn't just like, Do you want a body like mine? Well, do this, you know, other motivations, really trying to get intrinsic rather than extrinsic reasons for people to to exercise essentially or to take care of themselves. And also the other thing is, is that I just am really genuinely interested in human psyche. And as we know from multiple studies that are, you know, emerging and have been emerging for a long time is that our it's it's bi-directional like our brain is influencing our physiological health so same thing same reason I didn't finish the nutrition degree actually because I started one before I went to England and was like oh maybe I'm interested in nutrition because it seems to be the foundation of things and then I was like well like it, it appears as though there's so much more influencing our food or at least our choices that I want to understand even on a physiological level in the brain things like leptin, ghrelin, how those hormones are regulated that I would like to be able to to understand so that I can implement them into all the training stuff. So, Well, sustainability is so important when it comes to any exercise or nutrition plan. And, you know, the psychology of dieting or exercise is often more important than the physiology because if you're not going to start it, stick with it and continue it, there's kind of no point even starting. So relying on the habits rather than motivation is really, really key and something that I work a lot with clients trying to break that cycle and build a sustainable habit that sticks. Yes. So so I assume that's something that has helped you since you started psych, learning more about this stuff to try and understand people and what makes them tick and also trying to tweak up their habits so they can actually stick to something. Absolutely. It's a huge thing. Systems, not, not goals, essentially. Mm. Right. I mean, goals are great to have, but your goals are nothing that they will fall to the level of your systems. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure again, Shona. It's It's flown. What's that? 45 (laughs) minutes, I think. We did well. Did very well. Have you got any last or final words, any words of wisdom for Actually, this is this is a good one. Any advice for someone that's looking at maybe doing psychology at university or they're even a physio or personal trainer and they're like, maybe I should do that? Yep. Look, I would highly recommend, uh, I, it's hard because maybe you don't need to go to university for it. Like maybe you've already like spent your money on, on a degree in exercise physiology and you're just thinking like, I don't want to go back to uni. So there's definitely things that you could look at. I would look at, um, you know, doing modules in cognitive behavioral therapy. Cause I think that's really applicable to what we do because it's very much about, it, it's a doing form of therapy as opposed to just like kind of talking through things that you probably as an exercise physiologist or physiotherapist wouldn't have the it's out of your pay grade to really talk about you know long-term trauma but if you wanted to do that then I would definitely recommend something looking into cognitive behavioral therapy and, and any variations of it that are backed by evidence yeah great advice and I talk about this regularly being a physio or any type of health practitioner you're a part-time psychologist anyway so knowing about this stuff is is important um so yeah completely agree i think that's great advice and if it's never too late to change careers too because you started your psych degree at what age 34 i am yeah so you started started when you were 33 33 32 yeah yeah 
So it's never too late to go back to uni. A lot of people think, oh, I'm 28, I'm 26, it's too late. Oh it's never too late. No way. No way. There's people in my in my classes that are in their 50s. Yeah. Like, you just, I, I just, I would encourage it. I would say that actually for the psych degree, the older, the better, to be honest, because uh, maybe not the older, the better, but like I, I did not have the life experience to be able to apply stuff to this so I'm really stoked to be at this age and with this life experience um where I still feel like I can relate to to the youngins how about that TikTok eh um, <laughs> and, and you know chat to them um without feeling too too disconnected and yeah. at the same time I you know I heavily respect um anyone that's survived this long in our society and so yeah not that we have a really awful society I just mean like you know I respect my elders and so you know, I definitely feel like I can relate to them on, on certain levels because I didn't grow up with social media and I didn't grow up with a lot of the cultural things that um, that are now really prevalent today. And so I understand the two sides. Like, don't you feel like we're in a really interesting age yes. bracket? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, not growing up with social media was a good thing. I don't envy the kids these days growing up with that. Um, but yeah, no, I agree. Like, it's never too late. There was a woman that went through physio with me in the same year, and she was in her 40s, and she had, I think, four or five kids. And wow. she did physio, and she's still working as a physio, which is great. So it's never too Amazing. late. I also know a guy that did medicine when he was in his late 40s. Um, so Amazing. it's never too late. If you've got a passion for something and you want to do it, go for it. Just do it. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Thanks again, Amazing. Shona. Where can everyone find you online? Instagram, yep. TikTok. Instagram, do not find me on TikTok. I mean, you can, but it's terrible. I still haven't figured it out. But check me out on, uh, yeah, just head to my website as well. You can read about things I'm doing, uh, shonavirtue.com. Make sure you spell it V-E-R-T-U-E, not virtue like the word, but virtue my name <laughs> it is my real name. Not you did virtuous. ask me that last time. Yeah. <laughs> it is your real name? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this podcast is live on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all the podcast channels. Um, and as usual, stay strong. <laughs>